social gatherings as much as you can. You have to avoid a, an unessential contact, an essential travel. And yesterday, something was said very important, uh, even as you spoke to the lady from London, that is um, Tabitha Kavoy. She was telling us that some of the measures that are being taken in Europe or in UK is to ensure that uh, you are shielding the elderly. We also had Mutahikagwe, I believe it was on Sunday, saying that uh, you should not, um, the young people who are returning from abroad should not uh, walk straight to meeting their parents or their elderly uh, relatives because should they infect, uh, infect them uh, with the virus, then the chances of survival are pretty slim, bearing in mind that the immunity of those persons, elderly persons, has already been compromised. Therefore, stay at home unless you have to move out. And that's what we are trying. That's why you don't see a lot of us here at any given time. Now, we want to continue with the coverage of the coronavirus disease and the pandemic that it has been with over 380,000 cases now. Just listen to what the cabinet secretary appealed to Kenyans in as far as preparing for this. We are encouraged to note that majority of the people have, on, have complied with the measures we have so far announced. We continue to appeal to Kenyans to take the matter seriously and strictly observe the advisories issued which are all aimed at containing the spread of the disease in our country. But because of these measures that have been taken by the government, you know too well that by now 14 seater matatus are supposed not to carry uh, more than 50% of passengers. And also for uh, those that have a higher capacity, they should carry only 60%. And also to observe proper hygiene standards, including having a sanitizer. Yesterday we had a viewer uh, writing to us and saying that uh, they have not cited, um, uh, what do you call this, the sanitizer in the vehicle. And also, some saying that they are, they are being charged exorbitant fares. Listen to the cabinet secretary on his appeal to motor to operators. It has come to our attention that several public sector transport operators have now resorted to increased fares as a result of this directive. I want to make an appeal to those in the Matato industry and others in the transport sector not to increase fares for our commuters. By so doing, it will be counterproductive as we continue to fight this virus in our country. You will remember that I had said from the beginning that every sector is going to take a financial hit in this crisis and to expect that one sector is going to punish everybody else for them to maintain a scenario where they are earning as much as they could is immoral and unfair. And then therefore, we are appealing to the Matatu sector to kindly, kindly look at the situation, understand it, understand that the commuters they are carrying are not in the same position they were in prior to this. Some of them are not earning any money at the moment and to appeal for their reasoning. Appeals, appeals, appeals. I hope that uh, we can listen and adhere to that so that um, as Kenyans we can win this together. But now it's time to take a look at another conversation. Today is the 24th of March 2020 and it is the World TB Day. Tuberculosis has been a, a strain that has affected um, the populations uh, for decades now. But uh, the situation in Kenya has been wanting for quite some time. We've had cases of um, uh, multi-drug resistant strains affecting the population. And we'll be speaking to Dr. Philip Owit who is a technical advisor uh, with the National TB Program. And good morning, Dr. Tari. Unfortunately, we're not able to uh, get you on Skype. We just have to use the phone call. Uh, just talk to us about your reflections about the scourge that is affecting the world that is uh, COVID-19, even as we dive into the conversation about the TB and if you, there are any parallels that you can draw between the two infectious diseases. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yes. There are quite a number of parallels between the scourge which is now affecting the whole world, that is the COVID-19, and tuberculosis. Uh, annually, about 10 million people get infected with tuberculosis. Out of this, 1.5 million. This is about 
of those who get infected die of the tuberculosis. You actually think about it, a large number of people in the whole world are dying of tuberculosis every year. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 uh, is also affecting the whole world. And uh, yes, in Africa, we're also getting you know increasing numbers of cases. The mortality rate is also quite high. Mm -hmm. Although, when you think about it, it's still lower than the tuberculosis. You know, the mortality rate among those who have COVID-19, those who die, mm. about 3 or so percent of them die. But for tuberculosis, it's as high as 15 percent. Yes, so both are actually pandemic. Right. Both are actually affecting uh, the whole you know, the whole world. Mm. And uh, more interesting bit also is that uh, even in their spread and their presentation, there's quite a lot of similarity. You know, both are, uh, you know, spread through some respiratory mechanisms. Uh, of, of, of course, the COVID, there's a bit of, you know, touching and uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's coming into contact with surfaces. Uh, for tuberculosis, uh, being close with each other, I mean, just like uh, the COVID interacting, you know, being in close spaces, uh, highly crowded places, you know, these they share similarly. And uh, even in terms of how they present, there's some similarity. You know, tuberculosis will present with cough. COVID-19 also presents with cough. The characteristics of the cough might be a little bit different mm -hmm. in some individuals. Fever, that is common to both of them. Uh, some of, uh, you know, uh, the lethargy or rather the general body weakness and the rest that they do share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in as much as the world is currently experiencing uh, COVID-19, yeah. there's quite a lot of interaction with tuberculosis, and uh, the worry could be that, uh, uh, you know, even some of the people with TB could be mistaken to have uh, COVID-19. Some of those with COVID-19 maybe could also have uh, tuberculosis. So we actually still have to continue looking for both mm -hmm. this particular era, yes. Right, and Dr. Ari, as we get to understand uh, this strain, maybe you can help the viewer in understanding the tuberculosis and the risk factors that uh, could lead uh, to that situation uh, be just before we get into the complicated um, strains that uh, we can talk about. Yeah, some of the risk factors uh, uh, increasing the spread of tuberculosis include, yeah, I mean, include uh, congestion mm. and in overcrowded places. Right. Yes, uh, so, you know, high density areas, uh, poor sanitation, I mean, poor, poor aeration, poor ventilation and such. Mm -hmm. And then even those with some other comorbid condition, I mean, those suffering from other conditions which mm -hmm. suppress the immunity. And here we're talking about you know, those with diabetes, those uh, people living with HIV, children less than five years whose immune system is still a little bit low, those with the uh, kidney issues, so any any of those conditions which suppresses the immunity mm -hmm. also to high susceptibility or high at high risk of uh, getting tuberculosis. Right. And recently we saw a report released by the Kenya National uh, uh, Kenfia that is also in charge of dealing with this strain that you call HIV prevalence. And at that time we were talking about the national prevalence being at 4.9%. Per, uh, per and yeah. there has been a lot of parallels drawn between HIV and the tuberculosis. I don't know what the situation is now uh, with us getting better with managing HIV in the country. How has TB uh, patients been dealing, I mean, that are also infected been dealing with this? Uh, it gets a little back in history. Uh, in the 1980s when the HIV emerged, mm -hmm. the tuberculosis cases also increased exponentially. And uh, what we are witnessing in Kenya and a good chunk of, uh, you know, the Africa region was uh, HIV-driven tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. So the moment we win the war against HIV, we will also be in the right path to winning the war against tuberculosis. Okay. HIV services have been increasing over the country, I mean, over, over the recent years in the country. And, uh, you know, we've moved from uh, uh, co-infection rate, I mean, TB patients who are co-infected with HIV, mm -hmm. about 50% of them to, you know, up to last year, we are about only a quarter mm -hmm. of the patients are co-infected with HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a reflection of winning the war on, uh, winning the war on HIV, which okay. means if you continue strengthening the HIV services, you continue focusing on, you know, testing everybody, mm -hmm. or at least put what at least. Right. So they're initiating them on the right medication, 
mm-hmm. and achieving viral suppression, we improve the immunity of these individuals. And at some point, you're actually improving the immunity of the whole community, the so-called uh, you know, community, community effort. Okay. And, uh, you are protecting most of the individuals from mm-hmm. also getting tuberculosis. So this ends up having a reflection in the whole tuberculosis burden in the country. Okay. So we actually glad that, uh, you know, we are making some progress in terms of the HIV, HIV management in the country mm-hmm. uh, because this will uh, definitely also be a boost to the TB, to the control of TB. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, how do the numbers compare? Because if we have 1.3 billion adults um, living with HIV, how many of those would you say are suffering from TB and how is the situation? Is it the drug-sensitive type or is it the drug-resistant type? Uh, maybe let me uh, approach it from the international level, first of all. Uh, at international level, we perhaps have uh, 36 million people with, TB, I mean, with HIV. Uh, this is again 10 million people with tuberculosis. Uh, so you can see that the numbers with HIV is actually three times or more, much higher. Mm. But uh, in terms of the death, mm-hmm. tuberculosis kills a lot more than the HIV. Yes, okay. in as much as lower numbers with uh, tuberculosis, but higher numbers with HIV. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, I mean higher mortality. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of uh, countrywide, we perhaps have over one million people right. with HIV. One. Point four or thereabout. Uh, uh, this again is 150,000 Kenyans right. living with uh, tuberculosis. So 150,000 compared to one, one point something million. Yes. It's still a little bit low, uh-huh. you know, but the death due to uh, tuberculosis are still much higher. Okay. Uh, I, I just mentioned that uh, about uh, a quarter of uh-huh. those with tuberculosis have. HIV co-infection, mm-hmm. but if you, if you flip the coin, about these one point something million people living with HIV, mm-hmm. how many of them actually have tuberculosis? Mm-hmm. It's not such a large number. Maybe somewhere between one to two percent mm-hmm. of those currently living with HIV mm-hmm. are co-infected with uh, you know with tuberculosis. Very interesting numbers that you outlined there. So uh, you, you're saying about 150,000 people are living with, it, with, it, with the tuberculosis. Let's now get to the complicated uh, strains that you may have, calling them the drug resistance versus the drug sensitive. Uh, how do they uh, compare? How many have the drug resistant TB and what leads to that situation, even as you start the treatment regime? Majority of those with tuberculosis, fortunately, have the so-called drug-sensitive tuberculosis, which can be cured uh, if one is on medication for six months. Mm. A small fraction of this, uh, and uh, here, for example, let me let me just compare: 150,000 people with tuberculosis in the whole country. Uh, you know, and uh, as per WHO estimate, we should be having close to 3,000 people with drug-resistant tuberculosis. You know, so you compare. Uh, about 3,000 with 150,000. So those with drug-resistant tuberculosis are a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the country, we've been uh, reporting somewhere around 700 people or there about 800 with drug-resistant tuberculosis. So that means we are still missing um, some some good portion of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, the challenge with uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis is that in as much as we have few people with the so-called drug-resistant tuberculosis, but the effects are much, much greater. Treatment okay. have to be much longer mm-hmm. and spend up to two years or beyond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you can imagine being on treatment, uh, taking medication daily, and it's not just one tablet. It mm-hmm. can be, I mean, it's multiple tablets. Yeah. We can have those who are on injections, which you're trying to get rid of. So being injected daily for eight months. Right. Uh, the cost of this can be a lot more than, I mean, treating one person with uh, drug disease tuberculosis mm-hmm. and to the tunes of 1.5 million or more. Wow. Yes, so that's quite costly. Mm. And uh, even the side effects of these medications mm-hmm. can also be a bit, uh, a, 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 bit, a bit high. So we have to you know, ensure that we actually protect individuals against these particular side effects. If you actually think of it, there is, uh, you know, drug resistant tuberculosis, in as much as there might be lower numbers, mm-hmm. yeah, of course, just mentioned that you're still not detecting one. Right. But uh, the effects of it 
in terms of uh, on the person, mm -hmm. uh, on, 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 on the government, which is also showed that in this type of medication, I mean, the, the cost of the medication and the support programs, mm -hmm. and the economy can be quite, can be quite high. Okay. All right. I find that interesting that it would cost 1.5 million shillings to treat a drug-resistant patient. I mean, a patient with a drug-resistant tuberculosis. But first of all, what is that that would lead to the strain? Because from our reading, you find that um, you have to strictly take your medication as advised. What else could lead to, drug, to, to your TB becoming drug-resistant? Generally, there are two ways drug-resistant tuberculosis develop. One is uh, if you interact with someone who already has that strain. So, you know, tuberculosis is spread through the airways. Mm -hmm. So if, if I have a drug resistant strain within myself, mm -hmm. and I interact with someone and I spread it, so the bug or the, the, the bacteria which I'll be spreading is already drug resistant. Mm -hmm. So diagnose with a drug resistant form of tuberculosis. Uh, okay. But then the other, the other way of uh, developing drug resistant tuberculosis is by what you call inadequate medication, and this can be through various ways, mm -hmm. either the person not taking uh, the usual drug sensitive medication for drug sensitive tuberculosis adequately, you know, uh, rather the things which are inside the individual mm -hmm. themselves mutating and becoming drug resistant themselves. So I either get a drug resistant bacteria, okay, or or or, or I get or the bacteria inside me mutate and becomes drug resistant because of inadequate medication. Okay. And so when you speak about the cost being 1.5 million shillings, we know that uh, for so long the government has been financing this. How do you split the cost between the government and the patient themselves? Uh, one of the international goals, and even the country goals, is uh, to reduce what you call catastrophic cost to your uh, due to tuberculosis. What that essentially means is that uh, uh, when one becomes sick, uh, due to tuberculosis, we have to try and reduce that cost to zero percent. Mm -hmm. Zero. So the government uh, has been trying to shoulder that cost uh, in a much larger way. But mm -hmm. uh, to break down the cost, you know, you can have uh, cost due to you know I've lost my job or I'm not able to go to work. Yeah. So I've, I've actually lost my earning. Mm. Uh, those are uh, you know costs which are related to what I was essentially earning or what I'm not able to earn currently because of the medication. Okay. I mean, because of illness. But then there are also costs which are related to the medication, mm -hmm. uh, being able to, you know, provide all the medication and all the support services. Okay. The government is shouldering all of the costs of the medication uh, related uh, to treatment of drug resistant tuberculosis. So all that is, uh, you know, being provided by the government. But beyond this, because we know that uh, the patient is also, uh, you know, suffering some loss of income or uh, not being able to be up and about the way they should be, uh, we've been having some social support system, uh, which uh, helps take care of, you know, offload a little bit of this burden to the patient. So every month, mm -hmm. one who is on treatment for drug disease and tuberculosis, there's some amount reimbursed to him or her to be able to try and shoulder a little bit of this burden, you no know, more or less to try and... Uh, uh, you know, compensate for the loss of earning. Okay. Due uh, to tuberculosis, yes. All right. I want us to conclude, but before we do that, so when you are diagnosed to have the TB, whether it's drug resistance or the, or the drug sensitive, how are the, uh, what, what changes do you need to make to your lifestyle in terms of diet or even the things that you do on a daily basis? First of all, to get better, but also to reduce um, infecting other people. Yes. Uh, tuberculosis being uh, I mean, we know that it's spread through the respiratory system and through interacting with others. The first thing which we usually advise is that one needs to get diagnosed and be put on appropriate treatment. You might be surprised that, uh, you know, once you're put on appropriate treatment, mm -hmm. bacterial load or the, you know, the load of the bacteria in the system mm -hmm. really goes down fast, although one has to be on treatment for much longer, but uh, one becomes less infectious, rapid. And, uh, you know, uh, so mm -hmm. uh, the first strategy is, first of all, to ensure that one is diagnosed and one is put on the appropriate treatment because uh, that reduces the bacterial load and it actually reduces the chances of spreading it to others. But in the process, one has to protect those around him or her, his or her beloved, mm -hmm. uh, so by uh, 
for example, you know, adjust one or two things like uh, if you are uh, if, if you're in a an unaerated room, you have to okay. think about you know, spending time outside a little bit more. Okay. Uh, when you're talking to the young ones, especially, you know, those or the old ones mm-hmm. who immunity is a little bit slow. Okay. And a much more aerated place, much more ventilated place. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. You're able to ensure that you actually, uh, you know, protect them. Mm. And uh, uh, another one, you know, just be on the appropriate, uh, on the appropriate medication. Yes. When you are coughing, one right. has to practice now, you know, most stringently, the cough etiquette. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, through the cough, the sneezing, the singing, the talking, which, you know, through which uh, the micro- microbacterium is actually spread. All right, and Dr. I want us to conclude with the last question, which is uh, pretty important because at the time that we are having all these strains, COVID-19 and so many other um, flu-like uh, symptoms, what should you look out for to tell that uh, probably you have TB and should you be worried? Should you start coughing? And at what point should you start to get concerned? Uh, now for tuberculosis, uh, its presentation is not as acute as uh, COVID. I mean, I mean, by that I mean that uh, uh, one takes a little bit long before one starts developing the signs and symptoms. You know, as opposed to COVID, mm-hmm. where I'm infected, I have only a matter of days before I start uh, presenting the symptoms. Mm-hmm. Uh, for tuberculosis, one needs to look out for you know some cough which is persistent. Uh, you know, when this cough most of the time is productive, by productive I mean uh, there is some sputum in it. Sputum mm. can be of varied colors. So I have this persistent cough. Some of the time I've used some antibiotics, you know, in, in some of our settings. Mm. You know, that a cough can just be something, we, you know, we just take it lightly. Okay. Or some we go for the over the counter medications. But, you know, this is the one persistent cough. I might have used one or two other means to try and eradicate it, but it's not reducing. Mm. I'm experiencing some unintentional weight loss. I'm not mm-hmm. exercising, I'm not on a weight diet, but some of my clothes are just becoming bigger and bigger. Okay. Uh, yes, for adults, especially, I mean, you know, for the older population, mm. you are experiencing some drenching night sweats. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, then I have this fever which just doesn't want to go away. It's, uh, you know, so those are some of the key things. But of course, there are others, you know, like shortness of breath. I have some difficulty in breathing, I have some chest pain, but we usually say that the four important ones are, uh, you know, cough, mm. heat, an intentional weight loss, and uh, drenching night sweat. If it's okay. a child, mm. uh, is there contact with a known case of tuberculosis? Okay. Or, or someone with persistent cough? Yeah. Okay, all right. Dr. Philip Owiti, the technical advisor at the National Tuberculosis Program, speaking to us on that. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Ari, and wish you all the best even as you mark the World TB Day. Apparently, it's not possible for them to mark it in a public manner, bearing in mind that uh, social gatherings have been stopped. We now want to take a look at some of the feedback that you've been sharing with us since 6 o'clock. This is Emmanuel. You're saying that um, self-discipline is the medicine for corona in Kenya. You feel like you are not feeling well? Stay home. You just landed from abroad kindly do a self-quarantine let's all be our kenyans keeper who else writes to us on debrick the hashtag is debrick and uh, alpha zani you say we must stay at home the only solution we have as at now thank you so much uh well sms is now uh 2242 is the line that you need to write to us uh, through this is um Michael Mugaka from Uyugi, I mean, Michael Mugaka Uyugi from Kibra. Is there any government plans to start a free house-to-house coronavirus testing program? This will enable the government to trace the affected victims and to stop corona epidemic and our pandemic, not to increase countrywide. What you are told is that it's not possible to do mass testing, bearing in mind that the kits are not available. Uh, someone else writes to us on 2422, uh, joining the conversation since 6 o'clock. This is Paul from Kisi, and you are saying, Good morning. How long does the COVID-19 virus stay on the surface of a paper or envelope? This is the answer for you, Paul. And um, yes, the lifespan of the coronavirus on surfaces. On paper, it stays there for four to five days. So that's why you need not share your books or papers that you write. That's your answer, Paul. Thank you so much.
for watching. Thank you so much for watching Citizen TV. Of course, so many of you writing to us uh, via Twitter, Citizen TV Kenya, Sam Gituko at uh, Zinzi underscore K. The hashtag being daybreak. It's been a pleasure uh, having uh, your attention to talk about the coronavirus pandemic. And this conversation continues uh, so that we bring as much information as possible. But at um, the end of the day, what matters is what you do. And specifically, we're asking you to stay home uh, because you need to stay safe from the virus and also shield your relatives, especially the elderly. Do we have the uh, government directive number six? Yes, as, as it, okay. I'm told that we, we need to take a look at some of the graphics that uh, we have prepared on what you need to do or uh, what you need to know. If we can take a look at them, where are they? Yes, so the lifespan of, a coronavi of the coronavirus on surfaces. Uh, this is a continuation of what we were just responding to. Once you sneeze, uh, the sneeze can travel for up to four meters. The average is two meters. Uh, that is the droplets themselves, and they can stay in the air for up to 45 minutes. You can imagine, in the air, 45 minutes, so they can fall on you. Then if you are to sneeze into a clothing or, mask or, or a mask, then that can stay there for 12 hours. That's why you advise that uh, once you have been exposed to such kind of situations, especially out, out of the house, then those clothes have to be washed immediately or soaked in, in, in soap. Uh, just make sure they do not come into contact with anyone else. Then something else. Then they can stay on glass or metal for up to five days. Can you imagine? And uh, of course, we have a lot of glassware and metallic uh, property, matatus and water view. Once you sneeze on paper, it can last there for four to five days. That's why some churches, when they were operating, had taken off the hymnals. Then once you sneeze onto plastic, it can stay there for six to nine days. Be beware of that. Avoid the unnecessary contact with plastics. Then once you sneeze, it can stay on your skin for five minutes, uh, for a few minutes rather. That's why you advise to observe the cough etiquette, which is also uh, applicable with protecting yourself from TB. Uh, then finally on wood, it can stay up to four days. And so therefore, as you do that, the cough etiquette, I just wanted to indicate something. Uh, the cough etiquette, you uh, flex your elbow and you cough in there. Don't use your hands. If you should use a, a cloth, then make sure that it's washed almost immediately. Thank you so much for watching the show. My name is Sam Gituko. Up next will be Zinzi Kibiku at 9 o'clock. She'll be bringing you the latest in as far as the news is concerned. But we leave you with this message. Bye for now.